unceded, untraditional, uh, unceded traditional territory of this Coast Salish people. Uh, and um, uh, welcome to um, to this um, opportunity uh, to um, uh, present your um, you know, what you're doing and and what your um, what your budget what you're budgeting for. And um, so we'll, we'll proceed with your uh, presentation, and then there'll be an opportunity for members of the committee uh, to ask questions. Um, thank so you. Over to you, Michael. <laughs> thank you, uh, Honorable Chair. Thank you, and uh, good morning. Uh, everyone, uh, Deputy Chair and, and members of the committee. Uh, before I begin, I would uh, like to acknowledge that the place that I'm presently standing on is the traditional territories of the Kwangan people, uh, known today as the uh, Songhees and Esquimalt nations. Let me also begin today uh, by introducing to you uh, uh, my Deputy Commissioners, Oline Twiss and Jeanette Vandenbalk, uh, as well as uh, our Senior Communications Manager, Michelle Mitchell. I'm also joined by Dave Van Sweeten, who is the Executive Director of Shared Services, who serves in this capacity for the four officers of the legislature. Uh, we are all headquartered at 947 Fourth Street uh, here in Victoria, British Columbia. Now this morning, I will be presenting to you the budget and service plan for both the Office of the Information and Privacy Commissioner and the Office of the Registrar of Lobbyists for British Columbia. I serve in both capacities. I'm going to focus my address on four specific requests and why those are essential to providing our services to British Columbians. The COVID-19 pandemic has affected almost every facet of our lives as citizens, none more so than our connection with digital technologies that have accelerated explosively, changing how we work, how we learn, how we love ones, even how we see our doctor. And indeed, that is uh, the basis for our uh, presentation this morning. What hasn't changed, however, is the need for robust access and privacy rights. In fact, their importance has been magnified by the current crisis. As a regulator, the pandemic has more than anything called upon my office's role as dispenser of guidance and advice to a wide array of interests from businesses and schools uh, and educators to seniors, many of whom are navigating the digital ecosystem for the first time. It is for this reason that one of my key priorities as commissioner is to be proactive in addressing privacy issues that emerge as a result of these new technologies. More than ever, privacy and security questions arising from these technologies are front and center in investigation reports, audits, and guidance that my office is producing. Facial recognition technology, geolocation tracking, and the video surveillance are just a few of the complex matters we have examined since I last addressed the committee. I'll briefly summarize just some of this work. In February, I launched a joint investigation with my counterparts in Alberta, Quebec, and Canada into Clearview AI. The investigation, still ongoing, looks into allegations that Clearview AI used its technology to extract billions of images of people from the internet and created a facial recognition tool to be sold to law enforcement organizations in Canada. The release of the investigation is imminent, and I also expect uh, that there will be guidance issued on the use of facial recognition technology by law enforcement to follow shortly thereafter. In June, my Ontario colleague and I concluded a joint investigation into the massive Life Labs privacy breach. Undoubtedly, most members of the committee will have been amongst the many British Columbians affected by this breach. We publicly issued our findings and orders resulting from our work detailing, among other things, the company's failure to protect the personal health information of millions of Canadians. Regrettably, the details of the report are still being kept from the public because of court challenges by the company. The Ontario Commissioner and I are vigorously taking issue with these challenges. What I'm able to share with you is that we ordered Life Labs to implement a series of measures to address the failures we found. We could not have completed this complex task without the aid of the technology experts on our respective teams. I can report that the company has since complied with our orders. Also in June, along with colleagues in Alberta, Quebec and Canada, we launched a joint investigation into Tim Hortons and its parent company, Restaurant Brands International, because of reports that the company's app was deploying persistent geolocation tracking. We are investigating whether the Tim Hortons privacy law it is again a highly technical investigation that is ongoing as I speak with you this morning. And finally, in November, 
I initiated a review of BC's licensed private liquor and cannabis retailers. Our review focuses on the privacy management practices of those companies and will include questions about retailers' use of video surveillance and whether or not they employ facial recognition technology. I expect we will publish an aggregate report summarizing our findings uh, this year. I'm sure by now you have sensed a theme common to these investigations. They have involved complex technologies requiring considerable expertise to dissect and analyze. We anticipate that these demands will only continue to increase. New technologies, network systems, and changing attitudes towards information sharing are game changers. Information rights have never been more urgent or more complex, and everything is moving so very fast. If we are to properly serve and protect the privacy rights of British Columbians in the digital age, we will need the resources of technical and security experts to assist us with our investigations and audits. In some of the cases just mentioned, we have contracted for that expertise. In others, we have had to rely on the skill sets provided by other offices to do the security and technical assessment of the investigation. The latter leaves us with a significant knowledge gap in cases where we do not have a partnership in place. We have done a careful assessment of our needs and have determined that it is more cost efficient to contract out this expertise on a case by case basis rather than add a position internally as each investigation demands its own unique needs. Therefore, I'm asking the committee for an additional $100,000 for my 2021-22 budget to support my office in engaging in experts in technology for investigations, audits, and in developing appropriate guidance. This would provide us with access to the right experts at the right time to support sound oversight over the privacy practices that impact British Columbians. Now, I would also like to turn to the Office of the Registry of Lobbyists, or the ORL. The Lobbyist Transparency Act, or LTA, designates me as the registrar for the ORL by virtue of my position as Information and Privacy Commissioner. My responsibilities as registrar under the LTA include a mandate to establish and maintain a registry for lobbyists and to oversee and enforce compliance with that act. It is worth recalling that the purpose of the LTA is to support public trust in government decision-making. The Organization for Economic Development and Cooperation report on lobbyist government and public trust highlights the direct correlation between public trust in politicians and transparency in government decision-making. BC's lobbying law requires individuals whose communication with public office holders meet the LTA's definition of lobbying to register that fact and to submit other required information to the registry. My team and I are responsible for making sure that information is publicly available in an easily searchable online registry. It is through this that the public is given a window into who is lobbying our public officials and on what matters. It is important that this morning I update you on matters related to recent amendments to BC's lobbying law and its impact on my budget. The changes enacted in May 2020 further enhance transparency in lobbying communications. They include, but are not limited to, a requirement on the part of lobbyists to report monthly on lobbying activities directed at senior public office holders, report political and other specified contributions made to a member of the Legislative Assembly or their political party or constituency association since the last provincial election, to report gifts given or promised to public office holders, including the value of the gift, a description of the gift to whom it was given or promised, and the circumstances, and report who controls, directs, or funds lobbying. Taken together, these and other changes required a significant overhaul of the lobbyist's registry. To accomplish this, we secured at no cost the license for the federal lobbyist registry system, which we adapted to BC's needs. At the same time, these changes also necessitated supporting the lobbyist community, making the shift to the new system as a result of the amendments, as well as educating public office holders and the public alike about them. I'm pleased to report that my team successfully transitioned to the new lobbyist registry on May 4th, 2020, despite finding ourselves in the midst of the pandemic. As I previously stated to the committee, the new registry contains new advanced search functionality. This was one of the advantages 
of licensing the federal registry and will serve to further enhance transparency and lobbying activities in BC. I accomplish compliance with the LTA through a range of tools, including education, verification of information in registrations, compliance investigations, and levying administrative penalties. And as you can imagine, demands in these areas have increased with the new amendments. Since May 4th, we have seen a 354% increase per month in the volume of requests for information. We have also seen an increase in verification of registrations, an important step in supporting lobbyists by ensuring that information entered into the lobbyist registry is accurate. We are on track this year to complete 1,512 verifications, up from 317 in the 2019-20 fiscal year. To manage this increase in demand on ORL staff, we got creative and temporarily reallocated resources from the OIPC team. This was manageable only due to a minor and we believe temporary reduction in the files at the OIPC due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Reallocating resources allowed us to publish 15 guidance documents, 13 more than we had initially planned, to support frontline staff and meeting the increase in demand for service as well. In addition, updates have been made to the ORL website to support those frontline staff and assisting lobbyists, including an enhanced FAQ section with a built-in search feature. All of these demands will continue. Reallocating OIPC resources is not a sustainable solution. The ORL needs to further scale up our frontline resources and education plan in order to adequately serve lobbyists and the public. Therefore, I am requesting additional resources to support ORL operations under the recently amended LTA with two full-time staff resources starting in the 21-22 fiscal year. The additional FTEs would directly support the frontline staff responding to increased traffic volume to the registry resulting from the amendments. They will also be deployed to strengthen awareness about the LTA. The new registry also requires ongoing maintenance to ensure that it supports the underlying transparency objective of the legislation. This includes maintenance work such as fixing bugs and fine tuning the registration process so that it fosters greater compliance. Maintenance work also requires supporting updates to keep hardware current and secure. As the registry system is more sophisticated than the previous one and manages a, high, far, a far higher volume of traffic, we estimate that the ORL will need an additional $75,000 per year to maintain it. This would augment the $50,000 we have in the ORL budget for maintenance and would meet the demands for both software and hardware maintenance for the new ORL system going forward. I'd also like to spend my final few moments summarizing the final two elements of our budget request for 2021 uh, for inflationary costs and updating our case tracker system. The majority of my budget for the two offices consists of salaries and benefits. We have a staff complement at the OIPC and ORL of 41 positions. For the forthcoming fiscal year, 2021-22, my office is faced with an adjustment of 191,000 in inflationary costs which includes $126,000 for government-mandated salary increments and adjustments, an increase in building occupancy of $37,000, an increase in our shared services costs of $22,000, and an increase in our information uh, system costs of $6,000. I have reviewed our budget in detail and have determined that we have exhausted any flexibility. Therefore, I am unable to absorb these cost pressures without reducing staffing resources and disrupting service to British Columbians. I'm also requesting $90,000 for my office's share of the cost to replace the case tracker system for the officers of the legislature that share corporate services at 947 Fort Street. We have a separate presentation on this item later, as you probably know, this afternoon. So I will reserve my detailed comments and any questions that you may have on this item for that time. So to recap, I have four requests. Tech technical expertise on a contractual case-by-case -case basis, an increase in operating costs to support the increase in demands to the ORL, my office's share of the cost to replace the case tracker system, and finally, an adjustment to cover inflationary costs. The combined operating budget request to cover these new and ongoing cost pressures is therefore an increase in six, of $647,000 for a total operating budget of just over $7.5 million with a capital budget of $54,000 
for the 2021 fiscal year. This represents an increase of 1.44% to secure expertise in the technology uh, department, 4.09% to support the ORL operations and under the amended, legis under the amended legislation, and 1.04% for the case tracker replacement, as well as 2.75% for inflationary cost pressures. This represents a total budget increase of 9.32% compared to the current fiscal year. I would like to acknowledge the talented teams I work with at the OIPC and the ORL every day. The demands, as you can imagine, have been uh, extraordinary, particularly over the last number of months. Uh, they bring a commitment and expertise to their work uh, and service to the people of BC that is really unparalleled. And I really do feel privileged to, to work uh, with all of them. Uh, Chair, that concludes my remarks and I thank you for your attention this morning. And my team and I would be pleased to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, so um, now I'll open it up to uh, questions uh, from the committee. It looks like we found your presentation very thorough <laughs> and the supporting documents. <laughs> Does anyone just want a minute to collect their thoughts and think about, okay. Uh, I, have a, I have a quick Pam. question, Chair. Uh, okay, uh, okay, go ahead, Lauren, and then, uh, and then Pam. Mr. McAvoy, um, just wanted you to expand, if you wouldn't mind, a little bit on the additional technical support, $100,000 um, in this day and age, doesn't seem to go very far. I just wondered what, if you could expand a little bit on that. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, you know, I, we were trying to be focused in our requests, and um, I can say to you that when we did the Life Labs investigation, which is a highly technical matter, as I mentioned, uh, we spent approximately on that investigation on about $30,000. We have to carefully pick and choose the investigations we are going to undertake over the next year. Resources are obviously not unlimited. And uh, as we look forward, I'm going to, uh, we're, we're projecting probably to do about five audits investigations over the coming year, of which I can very well see that at least probably three or four of them are going to be a deep look into technology. The health sector in particular, I would point out, uh, for any of you, I've just recently had a, a doctor's uh, visit <laughs> virtually. Um, the the, uh, the privacy and security issues around some of those matters are are significant, um, but not just in the in the private sector, in the public sector as well, in the health sector here in British Columbia. We want to have a close look at. So pulling back the curtain will require technical expertise um, in thinking about three or four investigations. Uh, Realistically, I think probably in the around the hundred thousand dollar mark to uh, to sustain the proper um, expertise we need uh, to undertake that. So, again, with resources not being unlimited, uh, we will stay focused and targeted, and undertake those investigations we think have the broadest impact on British Columbians. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, um, uh, Commissioner, and I have. Uh, in the queue, I ha now have uh, three questions, uh, one from MLA uh, Alexis, uh, then uh, MLA Stewart, followed by MLA um, Laura. Thank you, a really <clears throat> a thorough report. Thank you very, very much. I just have one, a uh, couple questions. The one is just a, a small technical one. On one of the documents, and I'm sorry, I can't remember which attachment it does ask uh, for 622,000, but I know further in the document, uh, it actually says 647,000. So I know 647,000 is what you mentioned today, but it was page one of the document that says select standing committee on finance and government services. So we just may want to clarify uh, the, and make that figure 647. Um, the second question is, Moving forward um, in COVID recovery, do you foresee any further changes in the use of technology? Do you think we peaked or do you anticipate that you're going to be having to react to even more um, increase or uptake in the use of technology? 
So many of the uses of technology during this pandemic uh, have uh, existed. Uh, but I think the big difference is, is the acceleration. I think we can all feel it. I mean, from uh, retail, which was online before, uh, it has exploded. Um, you know, the, the big retailers. I, I mentioned the healthcare sector. Um, we have been quick to, uh, our, our staff has been really on the case with respect to giving guidance in a number of uh, areas. That would include the education sector. More distance learning, right? Uh, and for those of us who are former trustees, <laughs> uh, they're on the committee, and I know uh, uh, the member has been, as well as the, yes. as well as uh, member Dykeman as well. Uh, that's that's really radically changed things. It wasn't that it wasn't there before, but it's accelerated it. We got to make sure that those platforms are privacy protective for our kids and secure. I mentioned the the healthcare sector, um, even in workplaces, uh, and for seniors. Often the very first time that seniors have been online, and we hear about it all the time, our office uh, combined with the seniors advocate, uh, Isabel McKenzie, uh, to put together some guidance for uh, seniors, uh, things to look for when they're on the web, either uh, for, uh, for retail or other things uh, to, to protect them. So I think the demands on these technologies are, are only going to continue to increase. Uh, society's awareness is going to it, to increase. And uh, we as regulators in the field, and I say we, um, it's, it's, it's really, it's our office, it's my colleagues across the country, but it's other offices like the ombudsperson, who we are now working with, uh, for example, on artificial intelligence and its application in government. Want to make sure it's fair, it's uh, protective. So it's our offices working with others, our offices working across uh, the country, uh, to ensure that we are going to address the concerns uh, of Canadians. But those demands are only going to continue to grow. Thank you so much. Lots to think about. Uh, ben. Uh, thank you very much, Chair and uh, Commissioner. Um, thank you very much for that very thorough and insightful look into your operations. I guess the real question, having been uh, on this file for some time and been the minister responsible, I guess, uh, you know, considering what you just said, um, I guess I'm really wondering, have you given the view as to what the future should look like in terms of uh, protection of privacy uh, for uh, individuals and the protection of privacy of individuals through, uh, you know, the um, things like Life Labs, which I hate to use them as an example, but one of these companies that have uh, been exposed to uh, or subjected to an exposure. So I guess what I'm really kind of, ha is this uh, uh, change that you're proposing with a couple of extra individuals, some contracting out, going to get you to where uh, you can make uh, the legislature feel comfortable that going ahead, uh, we have certainty in this area and not feeling like that we've lost ground. Well, you're exactly right about thinking about not where we are. It's the old Wayne Gretzky and the hockey analogy, if I may be so uh, indulged. Uh, it's, it's not where the puck is. It's, it's, you need to anticipate where it's going. And um, we certainly do. Um, I've got a, an amazing team of people who stay on top of the latest uh, in technology issues as they affect British Columbians. Um, it is also an important reason why uh, members of the legislature have to address this issue by reforming our existing legislation. Both our Personal Information Protection Act, which uh, governs private organizations in the province, but also the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act, which governs access and privacy in the public sector. Those laws were, when they first passed, were, I think, I think it's fair to say, probably state-of-the-art, but they have fallen behind. Uh, I'll just give you one it's not a small example, it's actually a big example. Um, if a company breaches your privacy in British Columbia, they have no obligation to tell me that as a regulator. More importantly, they have no obligation to tell you that as citizens. Uh, we in British Columbia are, I believe, uh, pretty close to the only jurisdiction in Canada now that does not have mandatory breach reporting for those kinds of violations of people's privacy. And that needs to change. The uh, committee uh, to reform uh, the PIPA legislation uh, it continues to meet. 
Uh, the FIPA committee, these committees meet, by the way, every six years to review the legislation. It's fortunate, I think, the timing, your question is absolutely timely. Uh, we are now in the, the midst of reviewing that legislation. And I think it's really incumbent upon each and every legislator to look at those issues uh, carefully and to advance uh, the cause of uh, privacy and security and access rights uh, for all British Columbians. So um, the question, uh, Deputy Chair, is very timely and one step at a time um, in, in, in this regard, because as we hopefully get the legislation, which has um, uh, bre privacy breach notification provisions that allows me as a regulator to impose administrative monetary penalties on bad actors, that will require more support and that will require a bigger team. But we will take one step at a time. We will advance investigations that cast the greatest public light on some of these issues and we will use our resources judiciously to do that. Thank you. Um, next question from um, uh, Grace. Thank you very much and thank you for the presentation. Um, my question uh, is about the expanded uh, resources for the OLR um, and might come out of uh, contrary to our deputy chair being new to this committee. Um, given that the, uh, the changes came into effect in May of 2020, um, why was there many more reports needed than expected? Was there a request for more uh, resources coming in um, in advance of the change? Um, so just what explains that, that delay? Thank you. So uh, thank you. Uh, so the, um, the uh, government, uh, this government, previous government actually, uh, uh, in 2017 uh, committed to greater transparency around lobbying issues. Uh, it's something that my office, I had um, advocated as well. I think it's, uh, we often think, some people think of lobbying in pejorative terms. It is not. It is a key part of the democratic system. And the, the key aspect of our legislation, um, and when the uh, Attorney General, uh, still the Attorney General, announced these amendments, uh, focused on the importance of, of transparency. That's the key thing. It doesn't prevent uh, lobbying. It means that the public can see uh, into the system. To leading up to that change, we required additional resources to do that. And, and when it came into effect in May, uh, it's now clear to us that having experienced the system for a number of months, the volume of matters coming uh, before us, uh, the fact that, for example, registrations have to happen on a monthly basis where, where lobbyists have uh, engaged in in different kinds or additional lobbying activity in a month, they have to report that. So all of those reporting requirements, which are good because it adds transparency, but that requires uh, frontline support to make sure that people have registered properly. As you can imagine, there are lots of questions. The other thing I need to say about those amendments is in addition to additional report, the, it has broadened the scope of who is covered. And so there are many, many more people coming through the registry as a result of that. Uh, in the past, there were perhaps smaller organizations that weren't covered, but are equally important because small as you probably know, small organizations can have a big impact on what government does. That's, that's a good thing, uh, so long as there is light cast on it. And so the combination of more uh, frequent reporting and a greater number of people uh, means our frontline staff were just, uh, frankly, uh, pretty close to overwhelmed at the beginning. We've, we're trying to get that organized, but we do need more support, both on the just answering the phones, holding the hands of lobbyists who are maybe a little bit unsure, especially in, small, in smaller organizations, and also out there educating people about their obligations. Because what we really want to make sure is that people are compliant. We do not want to be in a position of having to administer fines uh, that's part of my responsibility, but it's it's really a last resort. We just want people to comply. And, and so both education and frontline staff will ensure that that happens. So can I just, um, Chair, if it's okay, just clarify. Uh, oh. So additional resources were requested in advance of that change, but then the experience of, of um, meeting those needs, of doing that educating, of, of actually uh, living through those changes, has demonstrated to your office that more is needed in addition. Yes. Okay, thank you. 
And and just uh, just on this, um, uh, I know the format is qu- is question and answer, uh, but uh, as I'm listening to the questions and, and answers, you know, I'm thinking about um, uh, small organizations, uh, and I think it is important that we we don't want to silence the public because they're afraid. Um, they, they don't know what they they uh, that they are allowed to do, and then self discipline by not speaking up at all. That, that's exactly right, and that's a that's a key part of the work that we're doing now in the education work. Um, I myself have personally done a, a speaking engagements with the, the nonprofit sector, for example, who I know uh, indicated some concerns about the changes. I completely get that. Our staff gets it, and that's why we spent a considerable amount of time educating. Uh, there's nothing to fear here, uh, and we will help. Uh, say, hold your hand through the process and make sure that uh, the proper forms are filled out. And if there's questions or not understanding how something works, um, I, I think uh, those who have engaged with the registry will tell you um, our our staff have been outstanding in in helping guide them. Thank you. And I see another question uh, from um, uh, MLA Dorkson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. McAvoy, uh, just one more question following up on Emily Stewart's question. Did you say that there is no obligation in British Columbia for a company to alert us of a breach? That is correct. That is correct. Um, As a matter of course, uh, some companies will do that voluntarily. Um, I have an excellent team of, uh, of policy experts who can assist those companies, for example, with advising them about whether people should be notified. Is this serious enough, a breach, that people should be notified? Say, you know, occasionally a slip of something may not require it if it doesn't, it's not going to result in substantial harm, but um, we can assist in that. But that is absolutely right. There is no obligation uh, to do so. And that is a serious shortcoming of the law in, in British Columbia. What what uh, strength then, or what ability do you have then to, I mean, once the infraction is found out by your office, so perhaps it's a ABC company finds out or has a breach of my banking information, and I make a complaint to your office, what, uh, I guess, teeth, if you will, do you have at that point to encourage any sort of remedy to that situation? I have some teeth in the sense that if that organization has not taken reasonable security measures to secure your information, I can order them to take steps uh, to do that. Uh, That's important, and that's something that we do uh, uh, certainly have done on a number of occasions. What I don't have the power to do is to administer any kind of monetary penalty on companies, particularly bad actors, um, where monetary penalties would act as a deterrent. This is a, uh, you may have seen or may not have seen, uh, there's been a law introduced federally now uh, that would give the Federal Privacy Commissioner certain additional uh, powers. Um, And there's also going to be within that legislation the power to administer fines. It was at one time thought, you know, that it would be kind of a shaming exercise if a company uh, was discovered to have breached your information, you know, the, the public embarrassment and the the goodwill to the company would diminish and they would make changes. I think most people now believe that's just not going to be enough. So the, the order power, the power to fine, these are all power of fines. As, as I mentioned, uh, what I have with the Registry of Lobbyists is a very last resort. But it's there to ensure that companies looking around realize it's going to be way cheaper for us to invest in privacy and the security of their clients, their patients, and all of that up front rather than to have to face the consequences if they don't. And so uh, British Columbia has to enter the 21st century. Um, the US, Europe, uh, my colleagues in the Asia Pacific, of which we're key members, key players here in British Columbia, our trade flows in the Asia Pacific. Um, more and more, these laws are being changed around us, which strengthen rights for their citizens. We need to keep up. Thank you, appreciate that. Thank you. And um, uh, the next uh, the next speaker is uh, MLA Kylo. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Michael, for your presentation. Uh, just following up again on this uh, this 
uh, I guess, the lack of requirement for notification with respect to breach. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that this is something that uh, has been top of mind for your uh, organization for a number of years now. Uh, and I think you mentioned that legislation uh, or drafting of legislation was underway. Uh, do you have any anticipation of when that uh, legislation might be being brought forward? I don't. Um, I don't. The, um, the, the Personal Information Protection Review Committee uh, began its work uh, last year. Uh, it was interrupted uh, by the uh, election. Uh, the committee has been reinstated uh, or re I should be re, um, uh, reformed. Um, my understanding is that uh, that their work will continue shortly. I don't know exactly uh, what further work is going to be done. I, I can say that a major event has happened between the time the committee uh, was dissolved and uh, reinstituted, and that is the federal initiative. Uh, not to get too deeply into the weeds here, but it's uh, British Columbia legislation, provincial legislation, must be substantially similar to federal legislation in order to be uh, have a sound legal basis. Now that the federal government is moving ahead, that's yet another reason why British Columbia needs to be uh, in step. Our laws need to be, they're never gonna be identical, but there has to be harmony between the laws. And as you may have gathered from my uh, presentation, when there is a breach nationally that affects British Columbians, say it's a big retailer, it also affects other Canadians. And it's really important that we as regulators work closely together. So Alberta, British Columbia, Quebec, and, and the federally, these are the four jurisdictions that have private sector privacy uh, authority. We work very closely together to make sure that uh, companies don't play us off against one another, but it's also good for the companies because it's a one-stop shop that they can go to. So that's the reason why we need to make sure our legislation is in harmony. I would hope that the government is going to look at an initiative this year uh, to, to advance uh, the privacy uh, rights of British Columbians. But of course, that is uh, to, the, uh, to, to uh, the government and the entire legislature to determine. Thank you, Michael. Uh, and did you also mention that BC is the outlier with respect to not having the legislation? Are there other jurisdictions across Canada that don't have legislation that deals with the mandatory reporting requirement when there uh, has been a breach? Uh, no, I think we're we're it on the private sector side uh, because the federal authority covers all provinces where there's no provincial legislation. Uh, so that would be Ontario, for example. Um, but Alberta has uh, a breach notification uh, legislation. Ottawa federally has it, and uh, Quebec uh, Quebec does as as well, uh, I believe. So, and even you know you look south of the border, um, uh, it's, there's privacy laws. It, it, it's it's a bit hodgepodge in the United States, but I think virtually every state now in the U.S. has uh, privacy breach notification rules. And Europe obviously has, has that through their general data protection regulation as well as the, the U.K. So um, th this is, uh, we, are, we are way behind. Uh, and so I, I won't uh, exhaust that topic any further other than you can probably feel the frustration in my voice, but it's not, it's not about me. It's, it's really about our citizens and their ability to be properly protected. And, and that's where it was, by the way, the, the previous committee uh, back in 2015, it was uh, 14, 15, recommended these changes. Uh, so it's been a long time in, in coming. And uh, uh, so we need, uh, we need uh, the government to take up the issue. Great, uh, thank you very much. And what was the name of the committee that you're referencing? It is the Special uh, Standing Committee to Review the Personal Information Protection Act. Uh, that, again, committee um, has been reconstituted. Uh, there is a similar committee that has been named to review the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act, so that's the public sector law. Um, once again there, uh, in, in my view, uh, there should be an obligation on public bodies as well as private bodies to notify people where there have been breaches. Yeah, obviously, government has a lot of sensitive information about all of us, and so uh, it's important that they be transparent when those things happen. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, and uh, another question from uh, MLA Lore. Thanks so much, and, and thank you, Commissioner. Um, 
The need to have uh, the, those resources uh, to contract out and the ever-changing nature of the technology and the use of that technology makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I was wondering if there are efforts uh, or systems being set up to pull some of that knowledge that you gain uh, through contracted out services to build the in-house knowledge, uh, although cases might vary quite a bit uh, from case to case as you as you outlined, um, seems to me that there might be some that then appear later uh, and a chance to kind of also at the same time bolster the uh, in-house in expertise on, on the changing technology. So I just wondered if you had any thoughts on, on that. Thank you. Yes, you're right. You're right. Every investigation um, and where we bring in technical expertise, uh, we learn from that. And it becomes part of the a greater capacity of our office. And I should say that um, I'm just, uh, I, I need to stay really proud of the people that I work with. I mean, they are, they care deeply about these issues. They study these issues. They keep on top of the latest issues. Um, often what we're talking about is, uh, um, is beyond the conceptual nature. We're into uh, you talk about the weeds. Uh, I mean, deep weeds about whether something is in fact privacy protected because of the the kinds of technology, the cookie systems, or whatever it might be that are working uh, that require a special kind of schooling. They require a special kind of technical expertise. Our job as uh, regulators, my job, is to try and take what is often arcane, very complex information and talk to the public about why it matters. And so uh, that's a good job of, uh, you have talk about building capacity. So our own policy team, for example, our own investigators uh, can take the knowledge we glean from these technical experts uh, and shape it into something that is readily understandable to the public and also allows us to readily um, guide, educate. In many cases, uh, there are companies that are not complying with the law, but they, they're not sh sure, they don't understand. Education is the first route. Um, it, it's always been my approach that that's, I actually believe people, companies want to do the right thing. And so that's the first avenue uh, where it's clear that's not the case. Obviously we will, we will take measures, but each and every investigation uh, we undertake helps to build that uh, capacity. But I still believe going forward, uh, particularly as the technology evolves, uh, we're gonna need that um, outside expertise to assist us. Uh, thank you. Um, and we have a couple more minutes, so I don't see any other uh, uh, hands going up to ask questions. So maybe I'll, I'll ask a question. Uh, I, um, you know, I represent uh, an urban constituency. And my observation is the more people are packed in together, um, the more isolated they are from each other. And I think um, there is a, um, a, a, an, an odd contrary correlation uh, between uh, privacy and loneliness. So uh, picking up on your reference to educating the public, uh, and I think it's, I, it's really important, the work you do to educate the public about um, what, you know, their rights to privacy and organizations, what, uh, what they can't do. But do you also provide uh, education about what they can do so that people aren't unnecessarily uh, uh, silenced and isolated from each other? Like, for example, like, you know, strata councils. Um, I, I have had contact with strata councils who think they can't communicate anything um, and it leads to more isolation and loneliness. Um, yeah, that, that's some, uh, and by the way, uh, strata councils and the kinds of communication within strata councils are some of the most oft asked questions we get in the office as to what uh, can and can't be done. It's a complex relationship between our legislation and the strata, um, uh, I was gonna say STA, uh, Strata Title uh, Act, I believe it's, it's called. Um, 
there are challenges there. Obviously, there are confidential matters that happen within councils. Uh, that's fair enough, but it's also people share a space and uh, uh, there's also provisions to ensure that that, that information is shared. J just on the general topic of, of, of what can and can't be done, one of the things that um, I have said from the outset of the outbreak of COVID is that the legislation we have in place now, whether it's freedom of information, protection of privacy, or the private sector location, that legislation is designed to allow the sharing of information to preserve public safety and health. It is there to ensure that the proper sharing happens. And the act is very clear about that. Oftentimes you hear this, I'm going to call it a shibboleth about, you know, privacy gets in the way of, you know, health and safety or privacy gets in the way of this or that. It is just not so. The law is set up in a way to allow um, sharing of necessary information to protect uh, public health and safety. The necess what's necessary to do so. And, uh, you know, that's kind of sometimes where the boundaries of the law lie, you know, what's necessary to do that. Well, it's going to be, it's going to vary from case to case, but you know, for the most part, common sense uh, prevails. Uh, people will share the information necessary uh, that's required to ensure all of us uh, live safely in the present epidemic uh, that we're in. Um, and and those mechanisms, uh, those mechanisms are there. I should also mention on the just to come back to the question about the, the stratas. We actually have a frequently asked questions uh, guidance on on stratas, mm -hmm. uh, which I think a lot of people have found helpful. We get a lot of questions. Uh, if you if you have constituents, if any of you have constituents that have questions or concerns about this, please feel free uh, just to call us directly uh, because we field those calls virtually every day and are able to guide. Uh, um, strata councils and individuals who may be having issues as well. Um, so uh, I would I would encourage uh, I would encourage that. Okay, thank you so much. Um, any other questions? Okay, it looks like uh, it it looks like you've satisfied all our questions. Uh, so uh, with that, I would uh, thank you um, for um, uh, presenting your case. And, uh, and engaging with us. And um, I guess we can um, wrap it up at this point. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. It's been my great uh, pleasure to, uh, to uh, meet with you this morning and, and uh, I look forward to many more uh, presentations. Me too, thank you. Bye for now. Bye-bye. Okay, so um, shall we take a five minute break? So, and that, and that means that Hansard can take a break too. <laughs>
Uh, and uh, uh, welcome, uh, Commissioner. Um, this is your opportunity to um, uh, make your case uh, for your, um, your uh, plan for the next year and your budget for the next year. And um, over to you. You're on mute. All right. There we go. <laughs> so <again>. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I want that I'm speaking to you today from the territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Tsleil-Waututh, Squamish, and Musqueam nations. I have with me uh, David Van Sweeten, who I understand was introduced to you by my uh, a fellow independent officer, Michael McAvoy, in the preceding presentation. I'm pleased to have this opportunity to meet with you this morning to tell you about the important work of our office and to address our budget request. As you will see, have seen from our submission, our budget request is very modest, an increase in operating funding of $12,000 and $15,000 of capital funding for fiscal 2021-22. In 2022-23, there is a projected temporary increase of both operating funding in the amount of 299,000 and, and in capital funding in the amount of 196,000. This is all for the replacement of the case tracker system, the database system used by our office as outlined in the joint submission from the four offices who participate in corporate shared services. By way of background, uh, I've just completed the first year of my appointment as Merit Commissioner. And while my first year was not what any of us uh, would have uh, envisioned uh, in mid-January 2020 when I started, um, it has been and continues to be an honor and a privilege to serve in this position and to do this work. And I'll start with a, a very short historical perspective on merit-based hiring. Um, the application of the principle of merit in the BC Public Service has a long and rich history. In 1908, the first legislation was introduced that set merit as a requirement for entry into the BC Public Service. In that year, for the first time, candidates had to pass a competitive exam and provide a certificate of good health and character. Between 1908 and 2006, there was a range of oversight in, the, in hiring processes through Central Human Resources Agency and an administrative tribunal. And then in 2006, the legislature appointed the first merit commissioner for BC the appointment of a merit commissioner in 2006 as an officer of the legislature to provide independent oversight was recognition that merit-based hiring is an important and integral part of building a qualified and professional public service, sustaining an engaged and productive workforce, demonstrating cre credible leadership, and importantly, maintaining public trust. As you know, part of my mandate is to uphold fair hiring in the BC Public Service by providing independent oversight of appointments to and within the public service to ensure they are merit-based. The public service defines my responsibilities to monitor the application of merit by conducting random, random audits of appointments, to provide a review of the application of merit as the final step in the staffing review process, in accordance with an April 2018 amendment to the Public Service Act to conduct reviews of processes related to just cause dismissals from the British Columbia Public Service and to report annually to the Legislative Assembly on these responsibilities. To fulfill this mandate, the Office of the Merit Commissioner operates with a small dedicated staff consisting of four full-time and two part-time employees. The position of merit commissioner is a part-time appointment to a maximum of half time. I supplement this small workforce by hiring auditors on a contract basis when we are engaging in our annual audit activity. 
In addition, I engage professional advisors as required also on a contract basis. Now, what I'd like to do this morning is to review briefly the results of our work, go over our service plan and priorities for the year and review our budget requirements to address those priorities. For context, as of December 25th, 2020, there were approximately 39,000 employees in the British Columbia Public Service. To November 30, 2020, there were 7,300 appointments which were subject to our overview and oversight. We take random samples of these appointments every quarter to audit a sufficient number to allow us to generalize the result of those audits across the public service. In 2019-20, this meant that we audited 267 appointments from organizations across the public service. The findings from this audit process, which can be extrapolated to all appointments of a similar type made throughout the BC Public Service showed that the majority of appointments were based on competitions which are merit-based. Having said this, a large number of errors, some of which resulted in appointments which were not uh, based on merit, were found. These findings are consistent with the previous year. While these are generally positive findings, there were weaknesses in the hiring process that were identified. The shortlisting category of the hiring process generated the greatest number of appointments with errors, mostly due to decisions to change, lower, or waive mandatory qualifications or requirements. The most frequent error identified in the hiring process involved assessment tools and standards, specifically a lack of substantive marking criteria and an over-reliance on generic marking scales. The errors with the most serious impacts uh, arose from judgment and administrative mistakes. Finally, we found the large majority of individuals appointed were qualified for the position to which they were appointed. In five cases, we found either insufficient evidence to determine the individual was qualified or that the individual uh, did not have or pass a mandatory requirement. There were no appointments for which patronage was found. Turning now to the second main line of business of our office, which is to conduct the final review of, uh, review of staffing decisions at the request of unsuccessful employee applicants. In the last fiscal year, we received 22 requests for review. Of the reviews conducted, I, ish, I issued a reconsideration director, uh, direction, I'm sorry, on two appointments. The most common ground for review was related to shortlisting, interviewing, and testing stages of a competition, including methods of assessment, criteria used to assess candidates, and some administrative issues. In addition, more requesters raised issues related to bias in the hiring uh, process from a procedural pr perspective than in the previous year. To date this year, 2021, uh, we have received nine staffing review requests. I, my office tells me that there was uh, an additional one this, uh, received just this morning. There is no way of predicting the number of requests that may be received in a year, and it is not possible to attribute what appears to be a decrease to any particular cause. I'm also pleased to advise that the office has undertaken a special study uh, of eligibility lists, the results of which are targeted to be reported by March, 2021. Eligibility lists are created at the end of the competitive process and are time limited lists of candidates who are considered qualified and ready to be appointed for future job opportunities with similar, similar qualifications and accountabilities. The study was undertaken based on observations by our office of the large number of eligibility lists being created, as well as the observation of a number of recurring issues associated with their creation and use that had the potential to compromise or create a potential risk to merit-based hiring. For example, when the order of the list isn't observed, an individual may be disadvantaged by not receiving an offer when they should have. To summarize then, our office reviews the state of hiring within the British Columbia Public Service through random audits, 
staffing reviews, and special studies or audits. I share the work of this work, I, sh I share the results of this work with deputy ministers and the heads of organizations for their consideration and direction to their staff about improving hiring practices. These results are also provided to the head of BC Public Service Agency, which is the organization responsible for hiring policy and providing advice and training for possible changes to policy and direction. My office has noted improvements in hiring over the years connected to the office's observations and recommendations. The agency head has responded favorably to our recommendations and reiterated their support for striving for merit-based appointments. Generally, with respect to my role of the oversight of hiring, I consider the state of merit-based hiring to be sound in the British Columbia Public Service. Over this first year in office, I have observed that while there are errors made and opportunities for improvement, there is significant effort and thought brought to the hiring processes. I'd like to say a few words about the status of our review of, of dismissal process reviews. In April 2018, my mandate was changed to include responsibility for the oversight of processes related to eligible just cause dismissals in the public service. To clarify, my responsibility is not to review dismissals that have occurred to determine if they were justified or supportable but rather to, to conduct an after the fact review of the processes and procedures followed in the dismissal processes to ensure that they were in keeping with government practice procedures and standards. The Public Service Act establishes that for a dismissal practice to be eligible for review by me, all avenues of redress or recourse such as arbitration or litigation must be expired or exhausted. Where there has been a challenge to just cause dismissals, it will be eligible for review after 12, well, there has been no, uh, el no uh, challenge. The re it will be eligible for review after 12 months. Where an employee does challenge the dismissal, the process would not be subject to my review until six months after all cha challenge proceedings were completed. In my 2018, sorry, my 2019-20 annual report released in May, 2020, I described the steps taken by the office to develop a, a, a process to ensure that comprehensive and consistent reviews of these dismissals were undertaken. In developing this process, it was determined that a proper review required access to legal information to determine if appropriate legal advice had been obtained prior to the dismissal. A draft protocol was completed in March 2020, which enabled a review of the first three dismissal cases received in our office. That protocol has now been extended to permit the review by our office of further cases while the protocol is finalized. The expectation is that finalization will occur in the near future. In the meantime, the work of the office in reviewing these dismissal process, these dismissal process files is continuing. The office has currently received 17 completed files for review. While the time to finalize a protocol has been longer than anticipated, the work of file review is now proceeding in an orderly way. I anticipate reporting on all of the files presently in our office in our May 2021 annual report. Turning to the budget request for fiscal 2021-22. In 2019-20, the office was able to fulfill its mandate within its budget allocation. In that year, the office commenced the review of just cause dismissals. Review of these files has continued in 2020 and is ongoing. As a result of this experience, our office has found that it has been able to internally manage the additional work related to this responsibility by increasing the hours of part-time staff and with the use of contract contracted resources. As we did not require the funding for the additional position identified in the last budget submission, we will be reporting a budget surplus in the 2020-21 fiscal year and have advised provincial treasury that these funds can be used elsewhere. We will formally report on the final numbers for the current fiscal year in the, in the fall budget with our next budget submission. 
The fact that we are managing the dismissal process reviews without the addition of extra staff has also resulted in a net decrease in 29,000 in our 2021-22 budget request when offset with increases for inflation and the additional staff, staff, uh, additional hours for the part-time staff. The other factors included in the $12,000 operating budget request are pretty much evenly split between case tracker replacement costs and inflation costs related to the items shown on the proposed operating budget by stop at page four of the budget submission. The $15,000 budget request for capital expenditures in 2021-22 is entirely related to the case tracker replacement project. Similarly, similarly, the increases in fiscal 2022-23 are driven by the case tracker replacement initiative with those costs reducing to what could be described as normal levels in fiscal 2023-24. The CTS uh, case tracker system replacement project is a major undertaking to replace a software system built in the early 1990s. I'll be joined by my three colleagues uh, to discuss this joint, this joint submission at 1 p.m. today. In terms of the project's impact on my office for the next few years, these are detailed in table five of our submission. If you have any specific questions for me, I'd be happy to address them. And in addition, and additional information will be provided this afternoon at one o'clock. This last year has highlighted the need for a skilled professional public service capable of delivering essential government service services in any circumstances. And I'm proud of how the work of my office contributes to ensuring that appointments to the British Columbia Public Service are based on merit. Again, I want to thank you for this opportunity to meet with you and I'm pleased to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Baird. Um, I was remiss earlier in uh, not introducing you uh, to uh, the committee members. So I'll do that now and I'll just do it in the order in which I uh, see them on the screen. Uh, I confess I don't remember everyone's constituency. Uh, so maybe when they ask a question, they can mention that. So uh, the committee is uh, made up of uh, uh, Pam Alexis, uh, Megan Dykeman, uh, ben Stewart, who is the uh, deputy chair, Greg Kylo, Lauren Dirksen, Mike Starchuk, uh, Harwinder Sandu, and Grace Lohr. I'll um, open it up for questions. We sometimes take a moment to kind of get into the swing of it. I understand. <laughs> uh, uh, Pam. Thank you, a uh, very thorough presentation, but I just um, want to go back to um, a comment that you made with respect to comparing year over year and the hirings and how we are, I, I expect through different practices that we've improved on the merit-based hirings. And I just, if, if you could elaborate a little bit about that. So you, your office, for example, um, you gave us, statistics of last year's sampling of 267 and, and on and on. And, and you said only five cases um, where skill may have been in question were, were discovered. And so how would that have compared say 10 years ago? And so what what's changed? I know you say you can't absolutely hmm. say for sure, but can you just give me a little bit of history and context um, around that and it, I'm sorry if this is such a, a you know maybe bigger question but anyways if, if whatever you can supply thank you so the the uh, results of this of, of, of last year um, are are, um, are comparable for the year before I'm not able to give you very much insight about 10 years ago um, and and the the results vary slightly from year to year, um, but certainly from my review of previous years, um, that there aren't sort of wild swings um, in the in the annual findings. So, so for example, in the last merit performance audit, 
we found that 50, 57, and I'll give you some more statistics, um, but, but perhaps by going over them again, it, it, it will help clarify. We found that 50, 57% of the, of the appointments were merit-based. We found that 37% were uh, merit, uh, but there was some exception. So there was an issue with respect to uh, design or application in the, of, within the hiring process. And we found that 6% uh, were merit not applied. And so, so there were um, issues uh, such that, that, that we could determine had a negative um, impact on, uh, on who was um, on the appointment process. Um, and yes, you're right, there were uh, five uh, where, where there was, that were either not qualified or we weren't able to tell um, whether they were qualified or not. So uh, I think it's fair to say there's some consistency over the years in these findings. Um, and I don't know if, if, if that's an answer to your question or if you want me to, to talk about, about why that is. No, uh, the fact that you've said that there's consistency year over year helps me understand, but obviously there's some very, very good procedures in place that, you know, that make the numbers so low and that's, that's a good thing. So um, I, I, I think I'm, I'm satisfied, but I would, I'd love to hear a little bit more about, you know, what changed that over time we get to these low numbers, which is great. So that's all. But that's I, fine. You don't have to answer that right now. That's fine. If there's other what, people. I, I'd like to say something. I, I think it is a good thing. And I think it is as a result of the um, consistency in our reporting back our findings to those responsible um, for, for hiring. And, and, and those findings being taken um, seriously. Thank you so much for that. And I apologies, Abbotsford Mission is my writing. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you to both of you. Uh, next on the list is uh, MLA Kylo. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, Commissioner Baird, uh, yeah, my name is Greg Kylo, uh, MLA for Shoe Swap. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I've got a, a couple questions. Uh, one is just what is the consistency in place uh, with in the public service as far as the review. So if an individual feels that they have been overlooked for a particular job, I think you'd indicated that before you can actually go in and have a look at a particular case, they have to absolve themselves of any other remedies that might be available. Is there consistency across the public service as far as what uh, that review or internal review process looks like? And is there an opportunity for appeal? Just wondering if you could paint for us uh, just a bit of a picture of what the internal, I guess, review process is within the public service before your office would have an opportunity to actually start an investigation. All right. So um, uh, I think what you're asking me about uh, are the staffing reviews and not the dismissal process review. So let me talk to you a little bit about the staffing reviews. Um, so staffing reviews um, uh, come to us after there has already been two levels of review um, uh, and, uh, and then uh, a review by the hiring manager with the uh, unsuccessful um, employee and then an inquiry by the deputy minister. Each of those have a time limit, but it's a short uh, time limit. Those occur um, and, and I might not have this exactly right. Uh, each one of those has about a five, five or 10 day time limit. Um, and then there's also a time limit by which they have to come to me. So I am the third step in that review process for, uh, for a person who has taken part in a competition and has been an employee who has taken part in a competition and has been unsuccessful. And that comes to me um, really quite rapidly. And with respect to those, and those are the ones where I said that there were 22 last year, and there's now uh, nine so far this year, um, I am the final uh, review. So there is no um, legislative 
uh, appeal process for those. And, <clears throat> and in those, I either uphold the um, hiring decision or I direct a reconsideration. So those move really very quickly. Okay, great. And in the case of uh, if, if your office does recommend a reconsideration, what does that process look like? And if, uh, if indeed uh, public service has already extended an employment contract uh, or a promotion to another applicant, uh, what kind of, I guess, basis, or I guess, what are the ramifications of a review? Uh, should the review uh, indicate that uh, that something untoward was happening? Do they open it back up again? Uh, what does that look like? And, and what are the potential fiscal costs uh, to the public service? So the, the, as a result of the, um, of, of the process, um, in, in almost all cases, the position that uh, is held um, in abeyance, held open, um, while my review is undertaken. And my, uh, my service uh, model for uh, responding to these reviews is, is 30 days, is a maximum of 30 days. And if I direct, uh, if a, if a um, reconsideration is directed, it goes back to the deputy minister um, who uh, determines a process that they will use um, for that uh, reconsideration. Uh, my experience has been that it's a thorough process and it's a thoughtful process and it's a meaningful process. Um, now, having said that, uh, the results of that process are not reported back to me. So once I have ordered the reconsideration, uh, that's essentially the end of my um, responsibility. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. Um, and so then in the case of a termination, uh, I'm assuming that's quite a, a longer, more lengthy period. Um, and, and I guess a, a question to you would be is that, do you see any value in the opportunity for your office to participate in the, uh, in the instance of a termination sooner uh, rather than, than waiting until after all other avenues have been exhausted uh, before having a look? Um, based on, on what my mandate is, um, which is not to determine if it was uh, a, a proper uh, just cause dismissal, um, but rather to look at the process um, collectively to determine if just cause dismissals from the public service are being done um, in accordance with standards and procedures and practices, in other words, are being the process is a good one, um, uh, then I think that the timeline is, uh, is acceptable. Um, and that it's, it makes sense for all of the other areas of recourse to run their uh, course and not to have multiple um, things going on at the same time. Great, thank you very much. Uh, and then just one kind of last question. Uh, in the case of terminations, uh, does your office only get involved in review those terminations that are actually brought to your attention for, you know, I guess where there's uh, cases of subsequent concerns or do you have a look at all instances of uh, just cause terminations? Well, all cases are brought to my attention. The, le the legislation uh, provides that all cases will be brought to my attention. And there's a process established for that. Um, it's up to me how many of those cases that I will look at. Um, but to date, we have chosen to look at all cases. Um, and uh, in the foreseeable future, I anticipate um, that that will continue to be um, our procedure, that we will look at them all. And at the moment, as, as I said to you, um, there have been 17 uh, brought to our attention and we will be reporting out on all of those um, uh, in May. Great, uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you to both of you. Um, we do have a bit of a speakers list. Um, I'll just give you the order so you know when you're coming up. Uh, Grace, Lauren, Ben and Harwinder. So over to you, um, MLA Lore. 
Thank you so much, uh, Chair, and uh, I'm Grace Lohr. I'm the MLA for Victoria Beacon Hill. Uh, I just had a question about uh, the travel line. I noticed there's not a difference between uh, this year's travel budget and last year's travel budget, and just wondering whether there were any plans to uh, change ways of engaging or traveling, given that we're not doing much of the traveling, uh, or whether that was just kind of uh, built in and in, in maybe the optimism we all uh, hold uh, that uh, we'll get back to doing work that way. Thank you. Yes, I think the I think the latter is uh, is probably the case. Um, I'm not an accountant, but um, Mr. Ben Sweeten will tell me if I'm off base here. But um, but I think at the time the budget was put together, there was some optimism um, that there would be travel again, and the and and a sense that it's um, preferable to have it in the budget and not to use it if if it's uh, unnecessary. Uh, given that it's a relatively um, small amount. I will be doing some travel, um, uh, but certainly I do not anticipate that the full $17,000 allocated will be used this year. Uh, thank you. And our next question is from MLA Dirksen. Hi there, uh, my apologies, I got disconnected there for a second. So this oh question God. may have been asked already. Um, how, how does a file start? So is it complaint driven or do you simply uh, review all files, which would seem to be too many? Um, and then can it be challenged by someone else that may have been an applicant to a position? So I think what you're referring to are the staffing reviews where there's been an unsuccessful employee candidate. And that person, after having gone through the first two stages, um, will then contact uh, my office asking for a review. So it's driven by the unsuccessful, so, so staffing reviews are driven by the unsuccessful um, candidate. And they will contact my office who will um, start the process and the employee, unsuccessful, unsuccessful candidate will provide to us the grounds for the review and we open a file and then, and then, and then the investigative uh, stage has started. Thank you. Okay. Um, so shall we move on to the next question, Lauren? You're, you're Did that answer. answer your question, um, Mr. Dirksen? did actually and uh, I didn't have another. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is from uh, Deputy Chair Stewart. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, uh, Commissioner Baird, thanks very much for your presentation today. It's been insightful and interesting and uh, it actually raises many questions. I guess the first thing is that the, the question about merit, what is the baseline that somebody like yourself in your office look at in terms of uh, the position, whether the hiring has been done on the principles of the uh, the goal of trying to find the right person with merit that is fitting in that role. What, uh, and I guess, is it something that you look at it independently or is it something that's provided to you by the public service agency? Well, we certainly look at it independently because that's the, um, that's the, that's the most important part of being an independent um, uh, overseer um, uh, of these things. Um, it's a, I think the best I can say is that it's a process. Um, and so um, if we, and, and, and of course it, it arises primarily um, looking at merit, um, I'm happy to deal with staffing reviews as well, but through, through the um, audit process. And that's a process by which we audit quarterly um, approximately 70 um, files from across the public service. Um, and we have uh, um, standards uh, for the auditors that, that have been uh, set. The mm -hmm. issue of what constitutes merit itself is um, defined in the, in the legislation in the Public Service Act. 
Um, and the and what the merits do, the auditors do, is they do a very thorough review of every aspect of um, of the hiring process, and they are mindful of the um, uh, of the uh, policies and practices of the public service, which um, which have been developed and refined throughout the years. Um, and then they apply those standards to what happened in each individual case um, to determine whether or not merit was applied. And also to see if there were errors, identifiable errors in the process itself. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so I, I go to your point that you made that eligibility lists were being created. I, I'm assuming that's with either in the ministries or the PSA. And yeah. those eligibility lists, um, what's the uh, basis of those lists? And you mentioned that you had some uh, concern. And I guess, could you tell us what the concern is? Is there something that, I mean, is there something wrong with that? Or no. is it just the way that they're developed? Um, uh, so we'll be, so what the concerns actually are, um, I don't want to get ahead of our, uh, of our reporting out, which will be in May. Mm -hmm. Um, and mm -hmm. so, uh, and so the results will be reported in May. Um, but the office, um, in doing its uh, work, uh, determined that there were th that there was a, a noticeable increase in eligibility lists being used as a as a hiring tool, um, and identified some concerns um, that may or may not have been borne out. Um, about these lists, um, including possible risk to merit based hiring based on errors within the process by which the, the lists themselves were created. Um, and so uh, it was determined that, that that was something we should have a closer look at. Um, and we have the authority to have special studies. And so that's what we've, what we've done. And, and so and so there were concerns um, as part of the audit process that emerged um, mm -hmm. that, that um, our staff identified as being reasons for having just a closer look at, okay. at this sort of uh, hiring tool. So just to continue, uh, Commissioner, just uh, with the uh, level of looking at the spectrum of people that you're looking at, you said that you do about 70 files and random audits, audits per year? Quarterly, quarterly. Quarterly, thank yeah. you. Okay. Um, then I want, I'm just wondering, what's the level that you are able to look at in terms of merit? Do you look at uh, within the ministries, um, you know, directors, uh, 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 ADMs, deputy, deputy ministers, where do you, what's the limits that you're uh, looking to? Right. So um, we look at people who are, um, uh, who are hired um, uh, under the public service act. So if it's an, if it's a order and council appointment, um, we would not be looking at that. I see. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, MLA Stewart. Our next question is uh, from MLA Sandu. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Commissioner Baer. I am Harvinder Sandu from Vernon Monashi. Uh, great presentation. Uh, it explained a lot. I have a quick question. When you talked about shortlisted candidates, do we have a um, scoring um, a scoring our documented criteria for the candidates who are not shortlisted, just in case if they come back to you and uh, express concern that they think it wasn't fair that they weren't shortlisted. How do we document that? Right. Thank you. So, yeah, so shortlisting is um, one of the areas that, um, uh, that, that can be a ground for review, because if you're talking about uh, a candidate coming back to me, you're talking about a staffing review. Um, and, and yes, there are uh, guides for 
for, uh, for marking and for shortlisting, and there are criteria. These, these are set by the hiring managers. Um, and, uh, and so that's really um, where they are, are best set, the criteria for shortlisting, relative shortlisting of, of candidates. Um, and that's, that's not something that we would interfere with, the criteria that are set, uh, or, or, um, unless, unless it could be demonstrated that it resulted in some unfairness, because that's what we're looking to see. We're looking to see if there's um, an unfairness in the, pro in the process. And so if there was a complaint about how shortlisting had been carried out in any particular uh, competition, uh, that's something that would be carefully looked at um, as part of our staffing review. Okay, good to know. Thank you. Uh, just a quick follow up. So in that case, those candidates often do they express their concern to the hiring uh, team or hiring manager or can they come to you if they feel that uh, they were not heard? Right. Um, so the legislation requires that they go through two steps before they get to me. First, they have to go to their hiring manager um, and obtain feedback from their hiring manager. And then uh, they have to go to the deputy minister um, who conducts an inquiry. And if, there's, if they still have a concern, then they request a staffing review from, uh, from me. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, thank you to both of you. Now, um, I have a couple, I don't see any other hands. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, I see we're coming towards the end of our time together. Uh, but I'll ask my questions and we'll see how, how far we get with it. Um, I'll ask them all at once. Uh, so uh, the first question uh, relates uh, to um, the comment about uh, the $12,000 operating funding request includes uh, $9,000 in net savings um, due to uh, contract work. So I guess my, my question is, was this, um, uh, if you... If you could tell us more about that, is it was this a deliberate decision uh, to save money uh, by um, contracting out work as opposed to um, hiring staff? That's one question. Um, my other question relates to, um, well, I guess it's three questions. Um, uh, is the is your mandate to ensure that the most meritorious candidate uh, is offered the job or or that that they are meritorious, and I'm I'm asking that as it relates to, for example, employment equity, and our changing views as a society about what constitutes merit. And then finally, with regard to your role in dismissals, um, just cause dismissals, would the results of your reviews um, uh, would they be uh, available um, to be used in an arbitration, for example, and um, uh, EI appeal? Because, of course, uh, if someone if it's determined that someone has been dismissed for just cause, they are not entitled to EI. So would they would would either party, the employer or the employee, have access uh, to um, to your invest investigation to make their case. I, I, I'm sorry, that's a lot of questions. <laughs> so let, let, let me start at the beginning uh, with the $12,000 uh, operating um, uh, requ request and the 9,000 net savings. So I think the best way to um, approach this is to say that it was, um, that this is how it evolved. Um, so uh, when in, in April, 2018, when the, responsibility was added to our office. Um, the initial thought um, was that we may need uh, additional staffing resources to meet that responsibility and that need. And that was built in to the budget. Um, and at that time, we really didn't know what the timing would be, how many there would be or how they would come, the, whether, they would, whether we would have 50 a year or 20 a year. Um, and so uh, the staffing was, uh, was uh, requested and was given. Our experience has been that we can manage this work with the staff we have um, and by using contracted 
resources. And so we now have enough experience with the dismissal process reviews that we have sufficient confidence in that, that we say we don't need that additional um, staffing resource anymore. Um, I can't say that that will always be the case, but certainly that's our view for the foreseeable future that we'll be able to manage it um, without an additional staff person. So, so it was a, I guess it was a decision, but it evolved um, as we saw how the cases would be. We started from with a brand new responsibility and not knowing what to expect. We now have some experience with it. Um, and so that's how that came about. And then your second question had to do with whether we're in fact um, charged with determining uh, whether the most meritorious candidate gets the job. And, and, and I think the best I can say to you about that is, is that, we're, is that um, our mandate is to determine that, um, that merit has been applied. And that's, as I said, it's, it's defined in the, in the act. It, has, it says, was a person who, who, um, uh, who was appointed, were they qualified by virtue of their education and skills and past work performance and years of continuing um, service. So we do not um, adjudicate in any way on whether the person appointed was the most meritorious. Um, so our level is that is that they meet the standard of merit um, as defined in the act. So hopefully that answers that question and I'll move yes, on. Absolutely. Um, uh, dismissals. So um, as I said, uh, by the time a dismissal gets to our office for review or before we can commence the review, all avenues have to be uh, finished. So, so in terms of whether, uh, and, and, and one more thing, we, we do not determine whether the dismissal uh, was, uh, was uh, supportable, whether the just cause dismissal was supportable. And so we're not um, running a parallel uh, determination to, for example, um, uh, a dismissal, dismissal lawsuit. Um, so we have to wait until everything is, is completed before it comes to us. So, so the person therefore would not be able to use it in an arbitration uh, or in a lawsuit because all of that will be finished before it comes to us, wow. right? And also we're not making a determination about whether it was supportable or not. We're looking at the process. Was the process um, consistent with the practices and standards of the public service? Um, you also asked about um, employment insurance and whether, it, would, whether they, it could be used there. And I must say, I don't really know the answer to that um, because the report, the report that I make doesn't identify any particular dismissal in any event. That's not my, okay. my job. Um, and also there's some uh, statutory protection for the work that I do. Um, so I don't, I can't give you a definitive answer about that. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. All very helpful answers. Thank you so much. You. Uh, before uh, we wrap it up and say goodbye to you, does anyone have any other uh, questions, observations at this point? Okay, well, thank you, uh, Minister, uh, Commissioner Baird. Um, thanks for your time and, uh, and your answers. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Okay. So shall we take another five minute recess? See you in five. Okay.
Porter. And uh, I'd like to welcome uh, our Conflict of Interest Commissioner, Victoria Gray, and her staff. Uh, as a reminder to anyone who may be uh, listening in on the meeting, uh, we are here today uh, to review the budgets of the statutory officers. Uh, and I'll just take a moment to introduce uh, the committee and then I'll turn it over to you, Victoria. Uh, so, um, and just um, uh, looking at uh, uh, the order on my screen, uh, the committee is uh, composed of Pam Alexis, uh, Deputy uh, Chair Ben Stewart, uh, Megan Dykeman, Lauren Dirksen, Harwinder Sandu, Mike Starchuk, Greg Kylo, and Grace Lore. So um, over to you, Victoria. Thank you very much. Good morning, uh, Madam Chair, Mr. Deputy Chair, members of the committee. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to talk to you about the Conflict of Interest Committee uh, Commissioner's Office. And you, you may see on the uh, group there is Carol Hoyer. She's our office's executive coordinator, and she is uh, the most familiar with budget matters. I began serving as commissioner on January 6, 2020, just over one year ago. I've had a chance to talk by, to talk by telephone to a couple of you, but I've not yet had uh, a meeting with any of you. The election was called before I had a chance to meet with the three of you who were members of the previous parliament. I look forward to meeting with each of you in person or virtually over the next few months. So first, a quick summary of our role. Uh, the Conflict of Interest Office is BC's smallest statutory office, but we have an important role. We seek to maintain the integrity of the members and to enhance the public perception of the integrity of the decisions of the legislature and its various decision-making entities. Our role is described in the Members' Conflict of Interest Act, and the work focuses on three things. First, helping MLAs to understand the conflict rules and assisting them to comply by giving advice, often in writing and often in short time frames when issues arise. Second, helping MLAs navigate the financial closure requirements of the Act. And third, responding to complaints and requests for public opinions and that can come from MLAs or from members of the public. In addition, we're involved with comparable offices across Canada in coordinating the development of best practices. The impact of members acting in a conflict of interest on the public perception of the members' integrity is very significant. If you've lived in British Columbia long enough, you'll recall that the political careers of two premiers, Premier Van Der Zam and Premier Glenn Clark, essentially ended when they were found by my predecessors to have acted in conflicts of interest. Uh, the members' conflict of interest came into effect about 30 years ago, and since that time there have been three long-serving permanent commissioners. The first was the late Ted Hughes for about uh, six years in the early, set, uh, early 90s, then the late Bertie Oliver for about 10 years from 1997 to 2007, and then the late Paul Fraser for about 11 years from 2008 to 2019. And there were some other acting commissioners uh, here and there in between. So I'll turn straight away to the budget. Our budget remains the smallest of all the statutory officers. Our appropriation for operating expenditures is $734,000 in fiscal year 2021, that being the one ending in a couple of months. We're requesting a budget of 738,000 for fiscal 21-22. That's an increase of less than 1%. It reflects a modest cost of living increase in salaries. And for the two following years, our request is for a similarly modest increase to $743,000 and $753,000. Our budget appropriation for capital expenditures is $25,000 in each of those three fiscal years. Our most significant budget items are salaries and benefits. I work on a 75% of full-time basis. Two of the three staff members are full-time and one works 60% time. So the staff time is 2.6 FTEs. If you include me, the office is 3.35 FTEs. The legislature is our landlord. We work out of the red brick building at 421 Menzies. Uh, in the, this location is convenient for members at least uh, pre-pandemic they were able to drop by to deal with um, financial disclosures and meetings. 
Um, but we also enjoy uh, the proximity to the legislative assembly. Our discretionary expenses remain low in large part because of the reasonable uh, rent we pay. Our work is driven by complaints and requests for opinions. As such, it's highly unpredictable what will come in the door and with what degree of urgency. Conducting inquiries and delivering formal public written opinions is very time consuming, but necessary. The public is entitled to know that the Members Conflict of Interest Act is understood and applied by MLAs in their work. I've not yet been required to investigate a complaint and issue a formal public written opinion. I know that such investigations and opinions call upon the office's resources in a significant way. I was a trial lawyer for nearly 20 years and then a judge for 16 years. And so I, I know what, uh, what kind of work goes into those, those um, opinions and investigations. Perhaps our most important work is the upstream work where we uh, try to assist to prevent conflicts from arising or managing the unavoidable conflicts we do that by providing information, guidance, and advice in a timely way. So the caveat, which I understand uh, our office routinely applies to its budget request, is that we may need to come back to this committee if we need additional resources in order to deal with an unexpectedly high volume of complaints requiring inquiries and opinions, or if the office is the subject of another application for judicial review. Uh, subject to that caveat, I do not anticipate any material changes to our budget. As a result of the COVID pandemic, our staff have been working primarily uh, remotely from home with occasional office visits, uh, sometimes brief, sometimes uh, uh, not so brief. We have not incurred any significant additional expense as a result, although we did discover the limitations of our technology and we upgraded our computers. <laughs> we did that within our budget. Uh, the annual meetings between me and each MLA commenced in the summer of 2020, but the election was called before I was able to meet with all 87 MLAs. I met with 36 MLAs, 10 in person and 26 virtually. Almost all of the MLAs have recently submitted their financial disclosure forms, which were due uh, about 10 days ago. My meetings with each MLA will start soon. Uh, I anticipate that as a result of the COVID pandemic, most of the meetings will be virtual ones. We got some practice with the virtual meetings in the summer, and I hope that uh, all the upcoming meetings will go smoothly. We don't anticipate any additional expense for the virtual meetings. Ordinarily, um, I and uh, other members of my office would travel to national and international conferences. This year, they proceeded virtually rather than in person. And as a result, our travel expenses were less than budgeted. We incurred modest expenses for a table and chair and keyboards to make the office ergonomically appropriate for everyone, but that cost was well within our budget. The primary change for the office has been my appointment as commissioner. I'm delighted to work with the dedicated, professional and long serving staff of the office who've made me feel very welcome and have assisted me greatly in learning my role. I believe you will have received my 2019 annual report. It uh, outlines the difficult year of 2019 for the office, during which Commissioner Paul Fraser became ill and passed away. The office was without a commissioner for three months, and then the Honorable Lynn Smith QC was acting commissioner for six months. The workload in 2019 was comparable to 2018. The number of requests for information and advice in 2018 was nearly 200. And in 2019 was almost 210, so that's an average of about 205. In 2020, there were about 5% fewer requests than that average, with 192 requests for information and advice. I attribute that slight reduction to two things, the pandemic and the election. One effect of the pandemic has been fewer events and speaking engagements for MLAs, with a corresponding reduction in requests for opinions about related uh, conflicts and gifts and sponsored travel. During the election period, the legislature was dissolved, so there were no MLAs to seek advice. Uh, there were former members of cabinet who sought advice and members of the public still contacted us, but uh, we did have fewer than usual inquiries. We used the opportunity of the election period to update most of our bulletins on items like uh, post-political office consideration and letters of reference. 
In 2019, Acting Commissioner Lynn Smith completed the investigation and publicly released the uh, opinion requested by MLA Callan, now Minister Callan, regarding his legislative committee work concerning ride sharing in light of his father's ownership of a taxi. This issue was the subject of media attention and the investigation and public opinion reflected the public concern. Also in late 2019, Acting Commissioner Lynn Smith completed the annual meetings with all 87 MLAs to discuss their financial disclosure. So far, I have not been required to investigate a complaint or conduct an inquiry. There have been some concerns raised by the public, which did not meet the threshold for me to conduct an investigation. Historically, there's usually been about one public investigation. Of course, I do not wish an investigation on any member. <laughs> uh, I, as a former lawyer and judge, am kind of keen to do it, but I, I don't want to uh, any member to have to go through that on the other hand. Our office has worked collaboratively with other offices and agencies on matters of shared interest. For example, we worked with the Office of the Lobbyist Registrar to coordinate our brochure on MLAs accepting gifts and benefits with their brochure about lobbyists reporting on gifts they provide to MLAs. We work with the clerk's office and the information and privacy commissioner's office on issues leading to the online posting of members' public disclosure statements. We're participating in the statutory officers committee on the implementation of DRIPA, the Declaration on Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act. We made presentations to interested MLAs and to incoming legislative interns. We anticipate that, anticipate that at some point in the future, we will be consulting extensively with the Ministry of the Attorney General and a legislative committee to update the Members' Conflict of Interest Act, either in accordance with the legislative review in 2012 or for a new legislative review. Our continuing work includes the timely responses to requests from members for opinions and assistance and from the public about possible complaints. I cannot discuss the opinions given to members in any detail because they're confidential to members. Our practice is not to publicize inquiries from the public unless they lead to an inquiry and public opinion. Our other continuing work is managing the financial disclosure for members. That includes preparing the public disclosure statements, which will be posted online through the clerk's office. For those of you on the committee who have not been through the process before, uh, our, pub, our office reports most of the information from your Form 1 financial disclosure on the public disclosure statements, but some of it is omitted, such as your residential address. Our priorities and goals remain working to preserve the integrity of the members of the legislature and the public perception of them and our provincial government through providing timely, confidential advice to members and timely and thorough responses to complaints. It's been my honor to serve since January 6, 2020 as commissioner. I look forward to meeting with each of you over the next few months, either masked and in person or virtually in masks. So thank you for your attention and I'll try to answer any questions you may have with Carol's assistance. Uh, thank you, um, Commissioner Gray. Are there... Um... Any questions? Um, I see MLA Dykeman has her hand up. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the really thorough report uh, that you just provided now and in writing. As I was looking through it, one of the questions that came to mind, and I understand that this is impossible to predict, um, but I'm wondering if there's any sort of historical perspective in relation to risk, the, uh, the ability to come back to the committee, should there be an increase in investigations? Uh, has that happened historically? I assume that would be by way of like an increase in professional services under um, STOB 60, but I'm, I'm just wondering what that sort of looks it looks like in, in understanding the risk that happens when something's complaint driven. Thank you um, for your, any, any prior information you can provide in advance. Um, I don't, I, I think way back, now Carol may, may be able to assist you. Um, I think when Ted Hughes was commissioner, uh, the, the Bill Van Der Zand inquiry, he, he retained outside lawyers and um, it was you know, much like a trial. And I think that 
I expect that he, at that point, went back to the committee. But in more recent years, I don't think that has happened. But Carol, do you know? I don't recall anything. And uh, referring to the Ted Hughes event, I don't know about that one either. Like, I don't know if they would have gone over budget because I would think they had already budgeted, you know, the possibility in, but it could be there. I don't know how much it, they would have gone over. And the likelihood of that happening again, I don't know. It's really hard to say, mm -hmm. right? It, it kind of depends on the, the nature of yeah. any complaint that was being investigated. Yeah. Uh, for example, the um, investigation complaint of the um, request from now Minister of Callan, uh, that was handled without any extra budgetary requirement. Yeah. It was one that was mostly driven by looking at documents and interviewing people. Um, and it was something that was able to be handled by Acting Commissioner Lynn Smith and uh, yeah. our legal officer, Aline um, yeah. Mockin, without the need to hire other people. I think we've got, you know, many of these conflicts is issues, there's no real dispute about the facts. And so it's a matter of collecting uh, basic, the basic factual information and analyzing it. And I, I wouldn't expect to have to hire outside counsel for that, to handle that kind of inquiry. The judicial review, and there was some, I can't think right now what the decision was, but there was a decision made by the committee and then the Democracy Watch uh, wanted the court to intervene. And it went to the Court of Appeal who ended up saying essentially that um, you can't go to the court for judicial review, that the commissioner's rule is, is um, part of as an officer of the Legislative Assembly, and it's not something that gets supervised by the court. I would hope that will stop any further judicial reviews. <laughs> but, you know, if there were a judicial review, um, I'm no longer a lawyer. We'd have to hire someone to uh, appear in court. Um, but at this point, I think it's very low risk that we would be coming back asking for more money. Wonderful. Thank you for the background on that. It's it's good to understand the frequency of something like that. So I appreciate it. Uh, thank you. And um, next up with a question or comment is uh, MLA Kylo. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you very much for uh, your presentation, uh, Commissioner Gray. I just want to say that uh, your 1% uh, request uh, for an increase in budget is uh, is exemplary. I think that uh, the deliberations of this committee would be much easier if everybody was only coming <laughs> looking for a 1% uh, increase. And I just have to say that uh, I certainly appreciate the professionalism of your office and your assistance in helping us uh, uh, have any questions answered before they potentially become an issue. So just want to really appreciate uh, the work of your office. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? I'm not seeing any hands raised or anyone uh, uh, indicating in chat that they want to ask a question. Going, going. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It, it looks like you've anticipated all of our questions. <laughs> All right. Well, I look forward to meeting you all and uh, good luck with uh, all your meetings. OK, Thank you. thanks for your time. OK, bye bye. Bye. So um, if the committee could just uh, stay on for a moment, I mean, that we'll adjourn. Um, until after lunch, and then there were some questions that people had. So, oh, uh, so I need a motion. So if someone could um, uh, move the motion to adjourn. Um, Pam and Megan, uh, all those in favor? Opposed, if any. Okay, that motion passes. Thank you. So we've adjourned. <laughs>